Okay, we are continuing our series of analysing the depth charts of the All-Ireland contenders in football and we are turning our attention to Kerry this morning. All-Ireland winning captain Dara O'Kneda is with us to analyse. Dara, how are you getting on? Not too bad at all, no one, how are you? Yeah, good. Uh, just before we get into the depth chart, because there's a lot of interesting things to get stuck into there, what's been your big takeaway, I guess, from the first couple of weeks in the league uh, under Jack O'Connor and his third reign? I suppose really all the thing that a lot of neutral observers and Kerry observers were looking out for were how are we going to do with midfield um, in particular. David Moore obviously is a long term injury coming out of last year's championship in Kerry and you're looking for somebody to progress there there was a lot of talk about um, Joseph O'Connor Joe O'Connor Austin Sex with a very good championship and then he gets injured against St. Finn Bars in the club championship and uh, so you're looking first game out uh, in the National League anyway was a midfield that probably wouldn't be first choice uh, Adrian Spillane and Sean O'Shea a bit of experimentation going on there probably wasn't experimented with long enough to get one game and when Kevin Feely did a bit of damage against Kildare in the second half I think they reverted to the veil lads who were coming back uh, David O'Connor and Jack Barry and uh, Saturday inside in Chile you'd have to say they played quite well against a, a decent Dublin midfield so that's the the, the, the takeaway I suppose up to now how, how are we doing at midfield how are we doing in terms of commanding position at tricky times in the game and that's what we'll be constantly looking out for over the next three or four league games as well and given the way the game has developed over the last little while, that's not necessarily isolated to who you pick at number eight and number nine. Obviously, the, the half-backs and the half-forwards yeah. come into that big time. That, that's it. I, I honestly thought, you know, let's say Sean O'Shea, for example, was a viable option at midfield. But I suppose it's a kind of a whole different mindset. I thought Sean O'Shea maybe was worth having a, a look at for three or four National League games. But obviously, I suppose, the game against Kildare, where the game wasn't grabbed by the scruff of the neck by a lot of players not just Sean O'Shea. I think they probably had, you know, rushed to get the, the natural midfielders back. But it's still an option on a bigger pitch on a drier day and in different circumstances. And you know, the, way, the way the game is being played, it is very much horses for courses on a given day. And, uh, you know, Sean O'Shea, Jack is a fierce fan of, of playing lads in their natural positions, in their best positions. And we all know that Sean O'Shea is an excellent centre-forward. So he probably will be positioned there for a long, long time. But that's not to say if the case arose during the course of the, the spring or early summer that maybe Sean O'Shea is an option against a particular type of opponent at midfield. It's worth, it was worth experimenting with, possibly, you know, experimenting that bit longer with it, like, but um, you can't argue with David O'Connor's performance and Jack Barry's last night against Tottenham. Absolutely not. Uh, well, let's have a look at your forwards first up, uh, Dara. We've been kind of looking at the forwards and working our way backwards so uh, for our radio listeners the starters in the half forward line are Adrian Spillane Sean O'Shea and Joe O'Connor and then your full forward line if you were picking the team would be Paulie Clifford David Clifford and Paul Ganey the first thing that really jumps off the page to me here Dara is the size of the half forward line because I think that was the the, 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 the yeah. angle after Kildare wasn't it that there were three five foot something lads in there Adrian Spillane Sean yeah. O'Shea and Joe O'Connor none of them are small lads yeah, this is your fantasy football pick really for the first round of the championship. It's not to say that it might change from, from uh, game to game. Yeah. But yeah, it is deliberately aimed at putting a bit of size into the half forward line and positioning Sean O'Shea in his best position. Adrian Spillane has given you a lot. He might he might not be, I suppose, your go to first choice midfielder, but he's certainly worth something. His grunt and his um work rate is worth something on a modern team and you know he can play wing forward and likewise I think it's more intrigue than anything else with Joe O'Connor um, saw him a bit in the county championship the last couple of years and you know he is a good footballer he's a lovely side, side step an intelligent player good you know good in, in possession of the ball and then you're saying okay where are your natural wing forwards the Darrell Minahans the Stephen O'Briens and these lads and Michal Burns you know well they might be playing later on in the year, but I would like for the first round of the championship possibly just to see Kerry team go with size and athleticism. And you get that with Spillane and Joe O'Connor. Um, I don't mean in any way because I'm certainly not a six foot, I wasn't a six foot guy myself, but you know, the old adage of kind of a good big guy is probably better than a good small guy uh, in the modern game, all other things being equal. And that is your fantasy f- football selection, really, at that stage. You know, Adrian Spillane at 10, Joe Connor at 12, Sean O'Shea chain between all six foot plus and all give you options if you are struggling in the field. How much, not that they struggled in midfield at all that day against Tyrone, but how much is that All-Ireland semi-final defeat informing the physicality that, that you would be picking in your fantasy football half-forward line? 
Well, I think it's been said, and even perhaps Milan said it on TV there lately, that Kerry lacked physicality. I don't think it's a question of physicality. I think it's a question of aggression. You can have a small, aggressive guy that would be extremely physical. I mean, Paul Galvinus was a six foot, not exactly a small guy, but he was extremely physical and extremely combative in that area. And that's that's probably what, what's, what, what you need. Um, every other, you know, Stephen O'Brien up until 2019 was a brilliant, brilliant player and is still a very, very good player. You know, he was one of the top wing forwards in the game. Um, Dara Minden, likewise, who's playing probably at 80% fitness at the moment and getting there and is a really good underage player and has a lot to prove at senior level but has had good performances at senior level. But the Toronto game... I suppose, as you say, we didn't lose midfield that day. I think Toronto did more damage against Mayo subsequently in the final of midfield than they did against Kerry. But what we did lack, I suppose, is when the breach happened at midfield a few times, it was catastrophic and it, 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 it had a knock-on effect right through into the full back line and then the three goals conceded. And you're looking for lads around that area with a sense of responsibility. What that means is... You know, when, when the ball break, doesn't break your way and it breaks to the opposition or goes to the opposition, that somebody 10, 15, 20 yards away makes that 20 yard sprint just to go to track the, the, the hard running from the opposition through the middle or along the wings. And I think Spillane and, and Joe O'Connor would give you that. Uh, they'd have to be programmed like any other player, I'm sure, would like to do that. And um, not to say that the likes of Darren Mind and Stephen O'Brien and Michael Burns don't give you that. But if and when they do make that tracking run, and if and when they do catch up, they're more physical in that area. and They're more likely to hold up the move and to give your backs a bit of a chance. And that's what's informing the, the selection in that line. Your full forward line then, when we look at that, it is Paulie Clifford, it is David Clifford, and it is Paul Ganey. I, I assume, obviously, the way things are at the moment, Clifford and Ganey are your two inside forward lines and Paulie Clifford plays a little bit deeper and, and really if someone like Killian Splann or Tony Brosnan were to get into the team they would need to be getting in ahead of David Clifford or, or Paul Ganey, right? Yeah, it's a big ask. It's a big ask, I suppose. That there, there are no guarantees in any team selection um, but David Clifford is you know, home and hose you, 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 and you keep him close to goal if at all possible. And Paul Ganey went through possibly a patchy bit of form but he was being moved around an awful lot. Paul Ganey is a lethal inside forward and still has it, you know, at that level. Even at club level last year, I was watching win a West Kerry final early December, I think it was. And, you know, a game that he could very easily be disinterested in. He was outstanding. His application, his work rate, his track. There was a high ball kicked into him about five minutes ago in a game that there were 10 points up. And he chased the length, didn't win the high ball, but chased the length of the field to win, to turn it over again. And you're saying, geez, this guy is a bit between his teeth. And he, if he's played in his natural environment with David Clifford inside, they're very, very dangerous. Great football skills, good ball winning skills as well. Uh, the last night against Dublin, Paul Ganey, ball was stalling out around the middle. And he obviously, to all anybody present, demanded a high ball, demanded it, took, took a step back from his man. And that showed a fierce sport of confidence. One, that the ball was played in his direction, and two, that he demanded it, and that he subsequently won the mark and kicked the ball over the bar. That tells me that he still has it at that level, you know. And okay, it's a league game in February, but it was a, you know, it, it was an important, an important game, and he he still has an awful lot to contribute there. There's a kind of an institutional memory there as a footballer, Paul Ganey. He was an All Star two years in a row a number of years ago. And there was people saying, OK, just because he's 30 now or whatever, he's starting to turn. He still has so much to offer that team. You can take him off for 10, 15, 20 minutes to go, but he will give you his all in that in that line. And himself and David Clifford inside, you'd have to put Paddy out, obviously. And um, with the fluidity of movement in, in, in all the forward lines at the moment will dictate that you, you, it's a luxury even to have two inside at any one time. You expect David Clifford, you expect Paul Ganey to track back and needs most and they you know they have a willingness to do that most of the time and uh, get hands on, uh, on defenders coming out with the ball you know that's that, that's critical to, 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 to the lads on the other side of the field. So, so how does that that Paddy Clifford role work then in terms of say instructions to the team because it felt last year at times early in the championship Sean O'Shea were going closer to goal and then obviously at the start of the campaign this year Sean O'Shea was at midfield so Paddy naturally fitted into an 11 type role that kind of gets muddied at times when you have Sean O'Shea sitting as, as a half forward does it or, or, or can Paddy kind of fit in wherever the gaps are? I, I think Paul is definitely can do that, you know, and that's not to say that I mean the previous management deployed Charlie O'Shea nearer the goal and then like you said, out the field as well. And that can be right in a given set, set of circumstances, but really you want you want to score you want to you want a forward scoring and there you have in, in that lineup you have four scoring forwards at least. And the other two lads can score. Adrian Splann and Joe Connor can score. Like Darrow Minehan scored a goal the last night and created a lot of havoc as well. But 
uh, if you have four scoring forwards that will guarantee you, you know that they'll have numbers and brackets after their names, you know that you're 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 the winner there straight away. And uh, I do think that you know Paddy Clifford had the game intelligence to to see as the game progresses, see to play what's in front of him. You know, if Sean Shea has gone in, that Clifford drifts out. If not, that he 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 he's the go-to guy for the receiving ball. And um, Sean Sean O'Shea is kind of like Donahoe Walsh of old, where you know there's constant motion and he's in a position to receive the ball. And um, that's invaluable for somebody where the heat is coming on. Let's say if you, if you have the likes of let's say Paul Murphy or Tyke Morley in possession of the ball in the half back line. And genuinely, he just coming on. That was in the last, first 10 minutes against Dublin in the, in the National League in the last day even, that you need somebody like Sean O'Shea presenting with a yard of space between him and his man. And Sean O'Shea has that, has that game, and Paddy Clifford has that game. They're both very comfortable in possession, both comfortable receiving the ball with their back to goal with genuine heat you know, on their back as they're receiving the pass. And players like Tyke Morley, like Paul Murphy, need to know that when Sean O'Shea or, or, or uh, Paddy Clifford receive the ball, that they're not going to spill it because that's that's where the trouble starts, really. And that's where Kerry's trouble has started. We saw him up in, in Kildare the last time Paul Murphy's in possession of the ball gets turned over because there's no genuine outlet there. Mm-hmm. But if you have Paddy Clifford and Sean O'Shea screaming for possession, demanding possession, with, a, with an opposition man right up their back, like, you still have to trust that they're going to win that, you know, that they're going to secure possession and not spill it and, and not make you look like a fool as a halfback as well. And I think those two lads have it. So I think uh, O'Shea and Clifford have the game intelligence to find those pockets of space to receive those out balls. And with ball in hand, they're very creative and very comfortable. We're just going to skip on to the backs here, Dara. And I think from the Dublin game, you had six backs who played well. So the question was, who drops out when Gavin White comes back in because he's too good not to start? So uh, you've opted for uh, Dan Donoghue going to the bench yeah. in the context of that and, and Brino Bioglieck going into into the full back line. Bioglieck, in fairness, Dara, has been one of Kerry's better performers over the last three years. While the hue might be one of disappointment around Kerry in general, Bioglieck has really seemed to live up to his potential now over the last couple of seasons. So can he do that same damage from, from cornerback as he's been doing in the half back line? Uh, you know, Tom, Tom O'Sullivan tends to do a certain amount of damage from yeah. cornerback, particularly at club level, sometimes at inter county level, and Brian has that force to get him out there. I mean, you know, cornerbacks and the wingbacks are very interchangeable. You know, you find yourself in that position over the course of the game anyway. Or Bill Glee would have won an All-Ireland minor medal as a fullback, would have played a lot of schools football as a fullback, plays a lot of club football at fullback and runs the length of the field, which is probably a bit easier to do at club level than it would be maybe at inter-county level when the, the attrition, once you get to the halfback line, it, you know, starts to happen. Um, really, Dan O'Donoghue is very unlucky not to be on this team because, you know, he, possession is nine-tenths of the law. He hasn't put a foot wrong all year. This is just preempting, I suppose, novice season, you know, a fresher season, really, for Dan. And that, you know, once the championship comes around, that probably there will be six backs uh, more accomplished than him there. But I think, would be, you know, if he has an excellent league campaign and you come to the first round of the championship and he's not selected, he can feel hard done by. But I, obviously, like every other county panel, um, I'd say training ground form would dictate all other things being equal, all players being available, free of injury and all that. That there you have. Um, I don't think you could fit in Dan O'Donnell ahead of Brian O'Begley, Jason Foley, Tom Sullivan, Paul Murphy, Tyke Morley or Gavin White. Um, and in that case, I have no problem putting Brian O'Begley um, back in the corner because he has played there, he's comfortable there. And yeah, he can he can still do his runs, just like Tom Sullivan does his runs, like provided the, the cover is there behind him. Um, Brian is you know, establishing himself as a, as a Kerry senior into county football. And the last day, even against Dublin, in the early phases of the game, you know, when the game in Dublin was a bit more intense in their game, you know, he was jumping and diving and breaking balls, securing it under the wet conditions. And the only, th- the only element that Brian has to bring to his game now at this stage is, you know, I suppose it's unfair to compare him to another former clubmate, Tomas O'Shea, who used to, you know, have a finished product. You know, Brian got a goal against Cork, got a goal against Meath in the Championship in the, in the Super 8s a couple of years ago. He needs to do that consistently and needs to, you know, take, take it on himself and trust himself and back himself when he gets into those positions because he's an excellent kicker. Um, his quality of his passing the last day from the half-back line was excellent, but that's not to say he couldn't do the same from the full-back line, um, provided you were dominating at midfield. And a lot of this is brilliant to play midfield, you know, one-way traffic, which as we know doesn't always happen, but I would have no issue with Brian as a, as a cornerback or as a wingback. 
And the, the other uh, options there that you have down in the bench in defence, Mike Breen, who obviously broke through for Kerry last year and, and was exceptional, and, and Dylan Casey, who was exceptional in uh, the, the jersey of Austin Stacks over the course of the winter. Like, I mean, people getting ahead of themselves, uh, possibly including myself, were saying that Dylan Casey could potentially be a, a full back straight yeah. away for Kerry. I guess a victim of Stacks' own success that he's not going to get a look in too early in the season. But from what you've seen, is, is there is, is the hype real, I guess, about Dylan Casey? Yeah, it's not so much hype, but I think people like about Dylan Casey is you're looking at the opposition's best forward, and after they played Austin Stacks in the championship and right through the Munster championship, the opposition's best forward didn't have a good game. So you're saying, okay, what happened there? Was it really tight marking? Was it in your face marking? Was it cynical play? Was it what? And all the way up through the last year's championship, right through to the Munster final against St. Fimbars, Dylan Casey kept really quality forwards tight. So he obviously has something. He's one of these defenders that probably mightn't get involved in, you know, supporting a run up the field or finishing a run like being a bed there, Thomas Sullivan or something like that. But he keeps good, um, good, good forwards, top class forwards at club level in particular, quite. And these are forwards like Sean O'Shea, David Clifford, um, Sherlock from, from St. Finbar. So he keeps these lads quite, which is what, you know, I think Kerry don't have a huge wealth of those types of players even you know you look at our you know an all-star cornerback like Tom Sullivan is probably known more for his offensive play than for his defensive play and I suppose Dublin would have found out three years ago now in the All-Ireland final that if you even as recently as the league game above in Thurless last year you can carry in Dublin where they obviously you know made a tactic of um, putting in just high ball and saying listen we don't tr- we free trust the carry full back line won't be able to deal with that I think the likes of Dylan Casey is one of the rare breeds of defender in Kerry that wants to defend and that needs to defend and that sees himself as a fella that keeps good forms quiet. And that's, you know, that's his value and his graph, I'm sure, would be rising again, provided he remains injury free. Yeah. Um, when we look then at the midfield, sorry, actually, just before that, just one, one other question I had on the defence, just with regards to that man marking job. Is there a way in which Kerry are going to be able to live without their top man marker if he does become that on the pitch? Like, are we seeing a paddy tally system basically, Dara, uh, so far in this league campaign, which would make allowances for people not being at the top of their game man marking wise, and and maybe there is there, there's a system in place there that will allow Kerry's vulnerabilities to be remedied somewhat. I'm sure every team has that kind of a thing. I think mm. it's probably too early to say. You know. I, I certainly can't say that I'm walking away from Kerry games so far this year and said, oh, there's Paddy Telly's imprint on, on the game. I'm sure there's plenty of other coaches in there telling them what to do in a defensive setup as well, you know. Um, so um, you'd have to think that, you know, Tally will, you know, will bring something to the to the, to the the table and, and that will manifest itself over the course of the year. You'd have to, you'd have to think. But, I mean, Kerry's, Kerry's big issue over the last number of years has been, you know, just these breaches that happen out the field and don't get stemmed in time. You know, look at the, some of the, the best goals that have been scored in Croke Park in the last number of years. You know, have seen players run through the middle and, you know, stick it in the net and it's usually carried to the receiving end of it. They're the ones that stick out in our mind anyway as carry men. You say, how did that happen? Mm. And you, you can break it down all you want. You can see, you know, all Merchant's goal where the ball's from the throw-in like in Dublin made it. It's not just against Kerry the double score like that, but you know, as as a Kerry person, you're saying, why is this happening? Why, you know, this this shouldn't be happening. Uh, Conor McKenna's goals last year against against uh, Kerry as well, where you can see it coming, in, you know, a, a, a bit off. You know, that scramble defence isn't there, and um, players are kind of minding their own patch, and then when they sense the danger, is probably too late. Um, I think I think no defender, you know, no matter how good they are, you know, they're going to be de- dependent on, on the heat that's coming on further out the field. When it's one and one or two and one, you know, I mean, Larkin O'Dell had a, had a chance there the last day, Dean Rock uh, inside him, and just it was a, because it was a bad pass, that should have finished in another classic Kerry goal concession, you know, where there's a guy on his own, it was Jack, actually Jack Barry that was chasing Larkin O'Dell the last day, and you're kind of wondering, how did that happen? But, you know, it was, and you, they're, the, they're the issues that need to be broken down and say, look, we can't, this can't keep repeating itself. There are warning signs in the National League that by the time you come to championship are too late to be rectified. And famously, Gary people would say the Monster Championship isn't exposing those weaknesses for them in championship football in the National League. Certainly it didn't last year. It was all rosy until you hit that stop. You know, the real top, top teams, the Tyrones, the Dublins, the Mayos and these teams, um, you know, they, they were exposed. So coming towards the end of this year's league campaign, I'd expect Kerry, like let's say their last two games are our man Tyrone. So, you know, they'll, they'll fairly iron out a few pieces in Kerry's back line if they're there. 
That's for sure. Uh, the midfield then, you're going with Dermot O'Connor and Jack Barry as your starters, David Moran and another Staxman, Greg Horn, on the bench there. I- is this your starting eight and nine if, if Moran proves his fitness for the start of championship? If Moran proves his fitness, you'd have to say he still has a role to play, but there's a lot of uncertainty. He needs to get yeah. his injury right. It all depends on how he's going, you know, I suppose. But when he does come back, it was a serious enough injury, I would say. I mean, Moran's value to the carry team has shown in the heat of battle against Tyrone even where you know Tyrone couldn't get a foothold around the middle there with four and there his ability to slow the game down and to to, to uh, you know secure position and make sure that you know a decent ball goes into the power line look that's that's still there all those things are still there but you know there is a bit of expectation around Jim O'Connor because he was such an outstanding underage player because he's so athletic um, watching him even the last night, you know, he, he played very, very well. I think that he got out of the match on the, on the TV. And he, he, you know, he has a high, high skill level. There was a few instances there the last day in wet, slippery conditions where his ball control was really, really good. Um, but looking at him and saying, okay, you're classic number eight midfielders, you know, I'm going to even go back to my time and say Dara O'Shea, who was a dominant, very dominant personality around the middle. When Dara went up for the ball, he hurt you. When he came down for the ball, he hurt you. <laughs> With the ball, he, he hurt you. Dermot is still learning that, um, you know, uh, you look at Con- Patrick's catch in the all Ireland final last year against Mayo and you'd say, wonder would David O'Connor do that? I think he's well capable of doing it. But he, the frame, you know, he's a big lad, but he probably could take another half a stone on him, you know. And, you know, I mean, with the, with the greatest respect to Dara, when, when he went up, he Dara Shea would secure a half circle around himself and he'd get the ball and he'd come down, he'd probably hurt you on the way down as mm. well, physically. Like, And that's that's the way it should be. It's like, you know, um, Diermer went up very honestly the last day, I think it was with Brian Howard in the Dublin game, where he's, you know, going up uh, on a wet night, you know, hoping to make a majestic clean catch. Did actually catch it once or twice, but then when he came down, the ball spilled. And again, that's to be expected on a wet night with, you know, good phys- physicality around the middle. But he's learning that, I suppose, there's no question about his ability to eat up the ground once he gets possession if it opens up in front of him left and right he's very skillful can hurt you on the scoreboard as well but he needs to bring that element to his game to make him you know, the leading number eight midfielder you know that's it inside here and carry so then that you have a guy that will you know be a perfect foil for him and that's the way it's always been you know traditionally with midfields particularly in carry um Darashe was the constant and then you had nine or ten different partners over the course of the career. David Moran became that and he had, I'm sure, a load of midfield partners over the last 10, 15 years as well. So I think, you know, this is a kind of a changing of the guard in a way, like David Moran is still a lot to contribute to carrying football. Of course he does. He's still probably the best midfielder in club football, championship football in Kerry. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it would be nice to see Diamond O'Connor, you know, continue on with his good run form and become that leading heavyweight uh, in every single way, midfielder in, in the county, he has the capacity. So um, I, th- I think he has the ability to do so. And I think there's a, w- with that expectation that's in Kerry of Diamond O'Connor, there's a lot of confidence as well that he's going to be able to do that because you know, would know the lad, but from what I'm hearing, he's a great attitude and you know that's, that's half the battle. Absolutely. The last thing I did want to touch on was uh, the goalkeeper. We kind of glossed over the goalkeeper position uh, yeah. with our two depth charts so far, but um, this isn't like a Niall Morgan situation or a Rob Henley situation. This is still up for grabs, I would suggest, Dara, but Shane Murphy's obviously started very well this year, and Shane Ryan, you have him down as his backup. Yeah, um, Shane Ryan is, you know, obviously the early after this season has been squeezed out and again possession behind tenths the law. Murphy hasn't done the whole pile wrong, even the goal that was disallowed the last night against Dublin, you could argue, you know, was pure bad luck. Um uh, and the ball hits the, the the post, hits his hand and goes in. But what he gives you from restarts. Uh, I, I think with Shane Ryan, he, he's you know, he gives you a lot of confidence under the under the high ball, but Shane Murphy gives you Probably a bit of a better restart, a bit more variety to the restart. The, the trajectory of his kick out is more varied. Um, it was kind of the David Clark Rob Henley argument with Mayo all those years ago. You know, is it easier to break their kick out or to crack their kick out with X or Y in gold? And with Shane Murphy, I think he has the ability to spot in the run up to a kick out that it, this requires a change. So the, the, the kick out that I was about to plan just right now, I'm going to change my mind in the run up. And I think more so than Shane Ryan, he's able to do that. Um, but both are very, very good keepers. Both are very accomplished keepers. But Shane Murphy's more of a footballing goalie. And if it's 
you know, again, all things in an ideal conditions that, that there isn't a win there. Shane gives you real long range pinging passes like over the top of a cover, over the top of a screen. And, and that's probably where he edges out uh, Shane Ryan, but I'd have confidence in both. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Shane Ryan would be your backup there. Just kind of a reminder of some of the other positions. Then you'd have the likes of Dan Dunahoo, Mike Breen, Dylan Casey in the backs as the backup. David Moran as your backup in midfield. And then the likes of Darren Moynihan, Stephen O'Brien, Killian Spillane, Michael Michal Burns as, as your backups in the forwards. Like, I mean, this really does paint a picture, Dara, as a, a team with serious depth, more so than they've had it at any point, I'd say, in the last maybe even 10 years. <laughs> I think it's unusual. I wouldn't like to be trumpeting their their abilities to do damage later on in the year because we've been burnt, I suppose, the last mm. number of years. League league has been really good. Once the championship's been really good and you've got to the all Ireland quarter semi finals, let's say, and it just hasn't happened for this group. But there is a consistency in terms of personnel even in this group right now, you know. It doesn't seem to be any bolters out there. All those lads that, that would be on the on the list, the lads even that you haven't mentioned, Gavin Crowley's Graham Sullivan's a stepping up comparison if he comes back from you know, he's probably the only bolter if he does come back from his yeah. injury in time. Um, you know, uh, J- Jack Savage again is a bit of a bolter from the county championship, you know, Ian O'Connor from the belt that is in there at the moment training then, you know, reward good being good club form being rewarded. Tony Brosson is setting the world on fire at Sigerson level, you know, and they, there, there's a consistency there in terms of the personnel. Um, there are no real surprises, and it's really unusual that, they, let's say, the second round of the National League would be damn close to your championship team, really, you know, um, barring one or two lads that have, that, that, that have to come back to David Moran's, as are injured, the Joe Connors, the, you know, the, the Mike Greens, people that have stepped away in the last year or two or three, you know, the likes of Jack Sherwood, with Tommy Welch, James O'Donnell, Peter probably Jonathan Lyon, Mikey Ganey, Shane Enright, all those lads, it was a natural thing for them to, to probably step away. So there's a core group there at the moment, but there's a consistent group there as well. And, you know, it's Jack O'Connor's first year of a particular term in charge. I'm sure, you know, Jack, knowing Jack, he doesn't like comfort zones. He doesn't like flatlining, perhaps. He doesn't like subs being comfortable. So if they're not contributing something and putting the squeeze on somebody in possession of the jersey, he won't be happy, just like any other manager would be like. But um, there will be an element of getting to know you. And I think, you know, that's the McGrath That's the opening rounds of the league. And by the time the championship comes around, I think they have a fair idea right now what their championship team is. Yeah, and I think that probably plays into the point you made earlier on about the Munster Championship potentially not being a, a great level of, of competitiveness for a team, so they're really going hell for leather early in the year. Uh, you've been listening... 20 years ago. Well, sorry, yeah, I forgot about 2020, but we've, we've blocked that out of the mind, haven't we? That's, yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've been listening to All-Ireland winning captain Darrow Kaneda go through his depth chart. Good stuff, Darrow. Uh, great work. Thanks a million for that, and we'll chat to you again soon. Cheers, on.